Welcome to IS Abroad <laughs> Advancement and Alumni Engagement's latest featured virtual experience, Love Letters to Dublin, a special event to celebrate the love of the written word. We are so glad you could join us. This event we know will add inspiration and joy to your day. It is now my honor to introduce you to Megan Markey, our IES Abroad Dublin Center Director. Megan has long been a very valued leader within the IES Abroad global team. She first joined IES in 2004 to lead the Dublin Center's community-based learning seminar, service learning, youth engagement, and education in Ireland. Megan continued her career with IES Dublin as the assistant center director and in 2015 assumed the center director role. Megan earned an MBA in education management from the Institute of Education at the University of London and a master's in sociology from University College Dublin, where she returned post-graduation to lead classes in quantitative research. Please join me in welcoming Megan Markey. Hello, everyone. Um, I just wanted to start by just saying um, this has been such a joy to work on. Um, a lot of my work at the moment doesn't involve working with students. So just having the opportunity to work with the three students that you'll hear later on has brightened my day. And I hope this session brightens yours. Um, I was going through the list of names as well to see who was going to participate. And boy, it brought back so many wonderful memories of students past. Um, it's such a pleasure to have you on and of course colleagues from all around the world. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, I've been given the job to introduce our writer, senior writers Pro program coordinator, Stephen McMahon. And Stephen, um, the task feels to me a little bit redundant because it seems like everywhere I go and everyone I speak to either knows or at least has heard of Stephen. This is no joke, I've been at you know, universities in the Midwest and I'll be presenting to a group of students who might be coming to Dublin in the, in the next semesters. And they'll come up to me like, oh, we can't wait to come to Dublin. I'm like, I know the theater, the social life. I'm like, no, 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 Stephen McMahon. I've heard all about him from my friends. Or I'll be sitting in an academic, coordinated, uh, academic department meeting in Chicago and one of the senior staff might lean over to me and they'll say, I heard you about this fantastic faculty member you have, Stephen McMahon. So I think it's kind of funny that I'm introducing you to, to him to you today, because if anyone knows anything about Irish culture, it's that we're really bad at receiving compliments, and we certainly would never boast. So uh, he's going to hate me for this. But we're going to go through some technical stuff first. He graduated with a BA in Humanities from DCU. And there he was nominated for the Millennium Scholar Award. He then did a master's in art and creative writing up in Queen's University in Belfast. Uh, in 2015, he completed a post-grad diploma in education studies at Trinity University. He's been teaching with IES since 2005. And in 2012, he was named the IES Abroad Instructor of the Year. He specializes in literature, writing, and the visual arts. If that wasn't enough, Stephen's also a great writer. Uh, he's been writing, um, his writing has been shortlisted for the Hennessy New Irish Writing Award and the, excuse me, the Fish Sto Short Story Prize, and he's been published in several creative writing uh, journals. What his bio doesn't tell us is that he's also consistently at the top of the IES student course evaluations. And they're completing, uh, completed every semester by students anonymously. He's also an excellent photographer. Some of our, his uh, photographs are all around the center um, and he's won some awards for photography as well. But that's not where it ends. <laughs> Steven's also just my go-to guy at the center. If, I, if my laptop's broken, if the dishwasher needs fixing, Steven is the person that I go to. I called him MacGyver on more than one occasion. But I think what makes Steven most exceptional is that he makes you feel like he has all the time in the world for you. So does it matter how long the list of things that he has to get done that day is? 
if you stop by his office or you pass him in the hallway, he will make sure that you're looked after. It doesn't matter if you're a faculty, a staff member, but most often a student. He will make sure that he gives you his full attention. And for that, I think that his mentorship has really impacted on so many students semester after semester. And it's often done over a cup of tea and biscuits and no one can compete with that. So with that, I wanna pass you over to my friend and colleague, Stephen McMahon. Megan, you're very kind. Um, I wish I had MacGyver's hair. Unfortunately, uh, that, that day has gone. Um, guys, it's a, a genuine pleasure uh, to be here. I'm very grateful to Megan uh, for the uh, introduction. Uh, I'm very grateful also to uh, Jody and Jennifer and their team for putting this together. And I'm conscious of time and I'm, I know everybody's time is valuable. I am containing my excitement, but there is a little giddiness in my voice. I'm sure you can hear it because this is the first thing that we've managed to, to do with students since April of last year and we live uh, to do these things. So I'm hoping what I have to share with you will um, be a good use of your time. And what I'd like to do is keeping in the theme of uh, a great affection for Dublin, love letters that the students have written. And I want to keep that in focus, but I want to draw out a couple of threads and in particular, I want it to be something that we can share, that we can read along with. I want it to be an aural experience, if we can do that. Uh, so by all means, since you're all muted, um, read along out loud. Hear the what we have to, what I want to share with you. Hear yourself saying it, if you wouldn't mind. And just to, um, to give you a sense of what's uh, on the cards for the next 25 minutes, we're going to basically do a tasting platter. Um, Mary, I'm very grateful that you're here, also a former uh, president of uh, IES Abroad. And you mentioned in a conversation before we started that you had a chocolate tasting uh, a party, so to speak. I'm hoping that this will be just like that, except it will be a kind of a, a literary picnic, I suppose. Let's go with that. And what I want to start, I'm going to share my screen um, to get that started. And share screen is the green button on the bottom. And I'll share that and allow, oh, it's going to be a little bit fussy. Bear with me, guys. Zoom is going to let me do that, I do hope. Let's see. Pat Ghani can take, can help. Thank you, Jody. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give it just 10 seconds. Okay. Um, because it's something to do with system preferences. And it's coming up on screen now. And I'm going to allow that. Okay. Let's see if that works. Share screen, PowerPoint, share. How was that? Ta-da. Was that, was that 25 seconds? Okay. Now, I, I've taken my pulse monitor off, but I genuinely feel my heart is going at about 160 beats a second here. So I'm going to just play from the start. Um, as I said, just keep in mind stepping stones. We're going to bounce from one reading to another. We're going to follow visual and aural cues, we'll call them, whereby something in one piece will prompt our the next piece we read, or it will introduce it in a way. And the first one I want uh, to start with is, I want to start basically at the end, and the end of an era and the end of, unfortunately, um, the life of WB Yeats. I want to start with one of his final poems, and this is the closing lines from the circus animals desertion and Yeats ill, fatigued, physically under pressure uh, towards the end of his life, still writing though, still motivated, still thinking, working through, still feeling his way around 
in order to uh, realize his uh, vocation, his artistic ambitions. And this is from the circus animals desertion. Now that my ladder's gone, I must lie down where all the ladders start in the foul rag and bone shop of the heart. There's something very heavy at play here. It's weighing on his shoulders, but he tries to move forward. He tries to progress, even just for that last little bit. Now, this line, we're going to go straight from this to what is one of the kind of pillars, the underlying pillars of the writing program. And that's a quote from Soren Kierkegaard that many of the gang will have heard as part of our orientation together. And that is this notion that it's quite true what philosophy says, life must be understood backwards. Keep in mind Yeats thinking back through his life. But that makes one forget the other saying that it must be lived forwards. How do we reconcile those two energies? How do we reconcile those two tensions? The more one ponders this, the more it comes to mean that life in the temporal existence never becomes quite intelligible. How do we make sense of things? Precisely because at no moment can I find complete quiet to take the backwards looking position. That's a great phrase, the backwards looking position. How do we manage it? Frank O'Connor, writer, philosopher in his own way, uh, certainly a great critic of uh, literary forms. He had this great conviction that it's everywhere in Irish literature, this looking back, looking back through time. With that in mind, we're going back to one of Yeats's first poems, one of his early successes as a, as a poet, as a writer. And this is the Lake Isle of Inish Free. Some of you have been there. Some of you, I hope, in due course will be there. Maybe we'll all go together. Wouldn't that be wonderful? In another lifetime, perhaps. The Lake Isle of Inish Free. I will arise and go now and go to Inish Free and a small cabin build there of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows will I have there and a hive for the honey bee and live alone in the bee loud glade. And I shall have some peace there for peace comes dropping slow dropping from the veils of the morning to where the cricket sings. There midnight's all a glimmer and noon a purple glow and evening full of the linnet's wings. I will arise and go now for always night and day. I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore. While I stand on the roadway or on the pavement's gray, I hear it in the deep heart's core. It's an obvious choice for an early Yeats poem, but I have a very specific reason for choosing it. And I hope that will become apparent. And I'm hoping that the value of what we look at will maybe stay with you because what we're looking for here are resonances. We're looking for these um, kind of aural stimuli to carry forward and to maybe become something in their own right. So keeping in mind some of the primary sounds of this poem, the honeybee, the peace he seeks, and the linnet's wings, the sound of bird flight, the sound of lake water lapping. Keep those foremost in your mind. And let's see where we can uh, travel with this. Now, next, yes. Yeats, that, came po that poem came to Yeats while he was in London. John, we're going back to London before the end, I promise. But while he was in London, standing on the pavement's grey, as he says, this poem began. The kernel of it came to him. He saw some water in a window, a fountain, a small display advertising something or other. And immediately his uh, imagination was catapulted across the sea through space and time to this beautiful space um, that was dear to him, a place where he spent many a day as a child and as a younger man. And him, this notion of being in two places at the same time, this notion of being able to transport ourselves emotionally, psychologically, imaginatively from one space to another, to be somewhere and yet have call to mind somewhere else and for it to be a vivid experience. 
to evoke is the best phrase I can come up with. This is an extract from a novel by Kate O'Brien uh, called The Land of Spices. And in this moment in the novel, Reverend Mother, one of the uh, characters we meet early on in the story, uh, stood apart by the side table in um, a, a house. Our memory had taken a curiously desolate plunge across many years. So she steps away from what is happening in the room with the other people and has this moment of, I suppose she goes into herself is the best way to describe it. But now as those deft Irish voices flowed together, forgetting her, she forgot them. She was momentarily a ghost where she stood and a ghost also where her memory revisited, divided within herself as lately she too often was. There's that tension. This wonderful, I'm here, and yet where, how did I come to be here? And would I go back if I could? There's this wonderful tension at play. Let's try and keep that ball in the air, so to speak. And I go straight from that to Astral Weeks by Van Morrison. A little bit of music, not too much, just peppered a little bit with music. And this is uh, just some of the lyrics from uh, the song Astral Weeks, from the album Astral Weeks. And anyone on the writer's program, I will have bored you with Astral Weeks at some point, but uh, it's a beautiful, um, it's, it's just beautiful, that's the best way to describe it. If I ventured in the slipstream between the viaducts of your dream, where immobile steel rims crack and the ditch in the back roads stop, could you find me? Would you kiss in my eyes to lay me down in silence easy to be born again? This silence easy, is that not the same space that Yeats calls back to in the Lake Isle of Innisfree? This idea of finding peace. I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow. To lay me down in silence easy, to be born again. We're going to stick with Van Morrison for a moment, but we're going to look or have a listen maybe to Van Morrison through uh, what Gerald Daw had to say about him. Gerald Daw being another Northern Irish poet, and also the author of a beautiful book, which is my first book recommendation I want to make to you, if, uh, if I can do that in this context. It's a book called In Another World, and it's uh, Van Morrison and Belfast. Gerald Daw himself, a poet. We realized we weren't singers, we weren't musicians, but we could move into other art forms. In that sense, Van Morrison opened the door for myself and other young men and women to think that work wasn't the only way forward, that there was a different kind of work and you could do it on stage or with a pen. Now, I include this at this point because this album, Astro Weeks and Van Morrison's profile and his presence in the world after the release of Astro Weeks, this transformed uh, Gerald Dawes' relationship uh, with uh, music and with himself. He started to believe that he could do something that uh, maybe goes beyond just cleaning windows as Van Morrison did uh, at one time in his life. This is the idea of having time to write, of making time to write and believing that writing is something that's worthwhile. And that's again, a kind of a, it's a, a supporting pillar of the writer's program, that notion of taking time out of mind to dedicate yourselves to writing and to make the time every day to write. And we go after that all the time. It's a, something we start off with and we touch back again, back to the rough ground, so to speak, back to the basic principles. What can you achieve in this four month period of study abroad? What can we do as your guides of sorts uh, during that time to, so that we get we can support you and get, help you to get the best out of things. And with writing, sharing books, giving the opportunity to share work, building momentum in that way, people being together with a shared purpose, with a common purpose. I want to go from that to this deep hearts core that Yeats talks about. And this is a poem again, Apologies to um, writers program, former writers program students. This is a poem I will definitely have shared with you. And it's a poem by Heaney, Seamus Heaney, called The Forge. I'll read it and then just tease out one or two threads. All I know is a door into the dark. Outside, old axles and iron hoops rusting. Inside, 
the hammered anvil's short pitched ring, the unpredictable fan tail of sparks or hiss when a new shoe toughens in water. The anvil must be somewhere in the center, horned as a unicorn at one end square, set there immovable, an altar where he expends himself in shape and music. The rhythms of poetry, the craft of shaping words, giving them a symmetry, giving them a shape that results in somebody being able to do that with words and Heaney is calling to mind the practices of a blacksmith. Now this forge, Heaney never crossed the door for five years. I was listening to a podcast earlier in which he's interviewed about this process and this strange world of the forge, you know, what happens in there? He saw flashes, he saw the blacksmith standing at the doorway. It took five years for Heaney to cross the door and uh, to enter this space and it's, it's there in the poem. He says, all I know is a door into the dark. What is beyond? You know, and they this is everywhere in Heaney's work, this notion of there being another world beyond the immediate one. And this can be either digging down through uh, the, the physical landscape, using that as an analogy for the endless possibilities of poetry. Expanding himself in shape and music, the rhythms of work present again, the rhythms of writing present again. Now, with that notion of red hot metal being shaped, the, the glow, the white hot glow of a piece of steel that has been heated and is being beaten into a particular shape, be it a horseshoe or be it a rose, which can often be the case. I want to look at um, a, a short poem or an extract from a poem by um, Derek Mann. Now, very sadly, Derek Mann passed away last year. And I want to acknowledge that as I will do with other writers as we proceed. This is stanza two from Tacitus. Tacitus being a, um, a writer in the, in the Roman era, a, a great master of Latin. So language starts to, to, to bubble up. The world though is also so much more. Everything that is the case imaginatively Tacitus believed mariners could hear the sun sinking into the Western Sea, and who would question that titanic roar, the steam rising wherever the edge may be. It's an extraordinary image, this notion of that you could hear the sun sinking into the Western Sea, as if it indeed is making contact with the water. And it's mythical and it's, it's kind of majestic as well. I want to just carry the white hot heart's core of Yeats's Lake Isle of Inish Free and through the work of Heaney, the shaping of white hot metal to this white hot sun sinking into the uh, Western Sea. Where might we go from there? Well, it's to a longer poem, but in the interest of brevity, I'm just going to include the last stanza. This is a poem by Paula Meehan called The Statue of the Virgin at Granard Speaks. It's an incredibly powerful piece. I do encourage you to read it in its entirety uh, in your own time. But here's this image again. Here's the sun called upon again to serve as a metaphor of sorts, to serve as an analogy. In the closing stanza of the statue of the Virgin at Granard speaks, O sun, center of our foolish dance, burning heart of stone, molten mother of us all, hear me and have pity. It's a prayer. It's an incantation of sorts. And in the context of the poem, it has a particular poignancy because it's a pagan prayer of sorts. So there's this wonderful tension again that's at play. Keeping on the theme of love and in particular, jumping off from Paula Meehan's reference of as the son, uh, as the molten mother of us all. This is a short extract from Three Stories About Love, which is a, a triptych by um, Anne Enright. Elaine dreamt that the baby could speak 
She dreamt that the baby was, in fact, talking to her, hugely and at length, endless sentences full of big words and all in a voice that expressive and sweet. The baby was actually very interesting. Dreams, the dreamlike state of Yeats in his, in his, you know, moment, absent moment on the, the sidewalk, on, on the footpaths in London. That strange moment that Heaney is, as he walks along to go to the bus stop, passing the forge, he wonders what's in there. There's a dreamlike state at play. And we again talk about this during uh, the introduction to our writer's program and again in classes, the value of dreams and the writing down of dreams. Here, Anne Enright is writing down, thankfully, on behalf of our character, we'll say, uh, a dream that has caused great distress. Here is somebody, Elaine is portrayed as pregnant on the other side of the world. Now, that has a particular poignancy at the moment where to be in Melbourne 18 months ago, it was a long way. It was 24 hours to get you home. To be in Melbourne now, you may as well be on another planet in many ways. So there's this great distance that's at play there. In order to appreciate the next uh, poem, you're going to need that visual image. The poem is on the left. It's on the next slide, so don't feel you have to read it. But just take five seconds there to get a feel, we'll say, get a visual feel for this. This is a Singer sewing machine. It's an old style sewing machine. The plate at the bottom that looks like a griddle would be worked by the feet in order to turn and to have the needle active. It's a beautiful desk. And that's what we're after uh, when we read this. This is coming from Anne Enright's, arguably her, the reflection that's at play in that piece on motherhood. Here we have another writer reflecting on her own mother and her relationship with her own, her own mother, and it, it takes a physical form. This is um, The Singer by Maeve McGuckian. In the evenings, I used to study at my mother's old sewing machine, pressing my feet occasionally up and down on the treadle as though I were going somewhere I had never been. Every year at exams, the pressure mounted, the summer light bent across my pages like a squinting eye. The children's shouts echoed the weather of the street. A car was thunder. The ticking clock was a heavy rain. In the dark, I drew the curtains on young couples stopping in the entry, heading home. There were nights I sent the disconnected wheel spinning madly round and round till the empty bobbin rattled in its case. Simplest of things, a young woman at university, McGuckin studied at Queens in Belfast, and here she is studying for exams. And something happens, a poem happens. What am I sitting at? Look, lo and behold, it's an heirloom of sorts in ways. It has a significance in terms of craft. It has a significance in terms of craft being overlapped, superimposed on other craft. The craft of needlework in this instance, the rhythms of working that machine and the rhythms of poetry, the rhythms of writing. We're going on a journey now. We, we're, we've talked about the home place in the last uh, two poems and in or the last two pieces. Anne Enright's character, Elaine, is longing to be at home, sitting in the cafe in Grafton Street. And here we have Edna O'Brien's The Country Girls, where we have Coach Brady leaving home for the first time, leaving home beyond her schooling for the first time, coming up to Dublin. Uh, so we've made our way around the country a little bit, guys. We're going, we're going to head into Dublin now for a spell. I remember nothing of the streets we drove through. They were all too strange. At six, the bells rang out from some church, which were followed by other bells with other chimes ringing from churches all over the city. 
the peals of the bells mingled together and were in keeping with the fresh spring evening. And there was a special comfort in their toll. I liked them already. A good omen, coach Ed O'Brien presenting our characters here in Dublin for the first time. And it's church bells. Church bells having a significance, a celebration of sorts. Also, you could, we can read into it slightly very quickly, this notion of bells ringing during a wedding, the notion of bells tolling during a funeral. So there's this tension. How will life work out? Coach in Dublin with Baba, her best pal, and the, the adventures ahead of them in their late teens. The sound of Dublin, I want to stay with that momentarily. And something has happened, forgive me, we're back. I want to look at The Butcher Boy by Patrick McCabe. Francie Brady, Coach Brady, Francie Brady, not related, but having the same experience in this instance, arriving in Dublin. Bicycles going by in dozens, tick, tick, tick. Where were they all going? If they were all going to work, there was a lot of jobs in Dublin. It was eight o'clock in the morning. There was picture houses and everything. And Francie, in his high energy of having run away from home, Dublin is now a playground for him. But this is the thing. We read, and our students, they do this and we don't even need to prompt it. The aural experience of reading something like this. Hang on a second, this reminds me of something else. So we just follow that really quickly. Bicycles going by in dozens, tick, tick, tick. The free wheel at the back, the old stormy archer free wheel that made that very clear sound. Well, where have we heard that before? Here's Heaney's a constable calls, a policeman, a constable arriving at his family home, Heaney as a, as a young boy. The policeman parks his bike. His bicycle stood at the windowsill. Opening line of the poem, later in the poem, a shadow bobbed in the window. He was snapping the carrier spring over the ledger. His boot pushed off and the bicycle ticked, ticked, ticked. There's that rhythm again. There it is. Where, what is it doing there? Well, it's interesting because I'll pitch it this way. I think it came from the same source. And that source is a writer that Heaney admired greatly and that Patrick McCabe lived in close proximity to, and that is Patrick Kavanagh. Inishkeen Road, July evening. This is the octet of this particular sonnet. The bicycles go by in twos and threes. There's a dance in Billy Brennan's barn tonight. And there's the half-talk code of mysteries and the wink and elbow language of delight. Half past eight, and there is not a spot upon a mile of road no shadow thrown that might turn out a man or woman, not a footfall tapping secrecies of stone. Kavanagh is at a remove. He's at a distance from all of this. He's observing, he's seeing. There's a lament at play here. He's not part of this. In the, in the language of, of uh, a painful case by James Joyce, he has been excluded from life's feast. But there's that sound again. The bicycles going by in twos and threes, that sound of bicycles passing. The dance in Billy Brennan's barn. This is Cayley by Karen Carson. Cayley, it takes its origins in uh, the Irish language and it comes, arguably comes from Le Cayley, which is a phrase that basically we can read it in different ways and it has different meanings in different contexts, but it's about companionship. And in this instance, a Cayley is a coming together for the purposes of music and dance, a party, essentially. In my grandmother's generation, um, to go on your Cayley would be to go visiting with friends, to go sit and drink tea, call around, walk on to the next person's house, and the momentum of that would carry you through the night. This is just a short snippet from Carson's uh, Cayley and also just to acknowledge uh, Kieran Carson passed away sadly in 2019 but his body of work is extraordinary and uh, in particular his last collection is it's, it's just the most wonderful uh, reading if there was a house with three girls in it it only took 
three boys to make a dance. You would see a glimmer where McKeown's once was and follow it till it became a house. There might be courting going on outside, whisperings and cacklings in the barnyard, a spider thread of gold thin syrup trailed out across the glowing kitchen tiles into the night of promises and broken promises. It's an incredibly aural experience. The laughter, the echoes in the barnyard, the music were there. And this is, our imaginations will carry us into this. And this is where we can find wonderful things as readers, but also as writers, where we find ourselves in a piece as we're working on it. We know that this is actually going well. This is going places. A quick reflection from uh, Paula Meehan on poetry before we clip on to the final few slides. <clears throat> poetry is not sociology. Poetry is not history. It's not the sum of the lore and logic it contained. Interesting though these things might be, poetry is a way of telling the truth about what it is to be human, a product of the human imagination and a sovereign condition onto itself, coded in measures that are close kin to music and dance. The rhythms again, an aural experience, reading and arguably writing as being an aural experience. I'll just pause there for a second to check with Jody. Jody, I think I have maybe four more slides. Are we okay for time? Yeah, I think we're fine. Tremendous. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I'll keep uh, I'll I'll keep the uh, the pace high. I want to include this particular piece because I, I've read this over and over and over, and I've never come across anything like it before. This is uh, a the opening lines of a short story by the weight of my called the weight of my words by Maura T. Robinson. And just to acknowledge Maura has been the most wonderful friend to the writers program has come in as a guest speaker uh, over the last couple of years and has done so with great enthusiasm. She's, the students love her company. Bernadette was good with words, but not with numbers. Numbers were red, angry, blurred things. Words had different colors, textures, smells. Some words were musical notes on a scale. The word sunshine was a G. The word weight was a B, but only if called after someone and carried on the breeze. She loved the taste of new words. She savored them, then wrapped them around her like a cloak, a lexical cocoon. Take that for 10 seconds. Just think about that. The notion that someone has portrayed Bernadette in this instance, words having a musical quality. Possibilities are endless. Anything could happen. Paula, we're back to Paula. And so we should be. This is Nomad Heart from her uh, collection, Painting Rain. Sometimes looking to the cold wintry stars, you can feel the planet move as it whirls in the flux of the galaxy, the whole path of the Milky Way buzzing like a hive. The city lights come on in twos and threes and leaves are freezing hard in mucky pools. Cars are stuck in jams or droning home. Dublin again, the vibrations, the sounds of the city. And here we go, buzzing like a hive, where have we heard that before? Yeats's Lake Isle of Innisfree, the Be Loud Glade that he refers to in the opening stanza. And here's Paula Meehan, the city and the music, the rhythm of the city. Ivan Boland, a beautiful piece called On Heroic. And I'm hoping that this will resonate for everybody, but in, in different ways. It was an Irish summer. It was wet. It was a job. I was 17. I set the clock and caught the bus at eight and leaned my head against the misty window. The city passed by. I got off above the Liffey on a street of statues, iron orators and granite patriots, arms wide, lips apart, last words. I worked in a hotel. I carried trays. I carried keys. I saw the rooms when they were used and airless. And again, when they were aired and ready, and I stood above the road and stared down at silent eloquence and wet umbrellas. 
floating above the city almost, up on the top floors of the Gresham, looking out, and the, the whole city is muted. Beautiful, it carries it up on the wind, and there is, again, the rhythms of urban life. This is a quick reflection from Ivan Boland on the river. I took that picture that's on the right. I'm not saying that to brag, I'm saying but this is the moment where anticipation is so important. I was on the bus, I saw it happening, I got off the bus and thankfully had a camera with me. And just for two or three minutes, this beautiful gelid light over the Liffey and the Hapney Bridge. I begin with the Liffey because a river is not a place, it is a maker of places. Without the river, there would be no city. Every day, turning its narrow circle, endlessly absorbing and reabsorbing the shapes and reflections of the city, it mirrors what is it has created. Forgive me, there's a typo. With the river, the city every day has to throw itself again into those surfaces, those depths, those reflections, which have served as the source of all its fictions, the significance of the river and how there would be no Dublin without the Liffey. And it's with the Liffey that I want to finish. And we're going to work our way out to the estuary of the Liffey. And we're going in particular to Sandy Mount Strand. There's a quick paragraph from the speckled people. And again, calling to mind the aural experience you can hear a dog barking at the waves. You can see him standing in the water, barking and trying to bite the foam. You can see how long it takes for the sound of the barking to come across as if it's coming from somewhere else and doesn't belong to the dog at all anymore. As if he's barking and barking so much that he's hoarse and lost his voice. The way sound works in open spaces, that has a fantastic significance in the context of Hamilton's novel, The Speckled People, a character caught between cultures, a German father, an Irish mother, and the tension there between languages and identity. It's a field day. And again, another recommendation, if and when you have the time. This is, if, I, if I'm, yeah, this is the second last slide, and a minute will see us settled again and landed. I had to include some Ulysses. I had eight slides on Joyce and I had to go through them with surgical precision and pick out, I ended up just with one. And this is from episode three of Ulysses. And it's mid morning and one of the main characters in Ulysses, Steph Stephen Dedalus is walking towards Dublin along Sandy Mount Strand. And he sees a couple up ahead their dog ambled about a bank of dwindling sand, trotting, sniffing on all sides, looking for something lost in a past life. Suddenly he made off like a bounding hare, ears flung back, chasing the shadow of a low skimming gull. The man's shrieked whistle struck his limp ears. He turned, bounded back, came nearer, trotted on twinkling shanks. Later, in that same chapter, the same dog, at the lace fringe of the tide, he halted with stiff forehoofs, seaward pointed ears, his snout lifted, barked at the wave noise, herds of sea moors, they serpented towards his feet, curling, unfurling many crests, every ninth breaking, plashing from far, from farther out, waves and waves, his hind paws then scattered the sand. Then his forepaws dabbled and delved. He rooted in the sand, dabbling, delving, and stopped to listen to the air, scraped up the sand again with a fury of his claws, soon ceasing. Having just read that out loud, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed reading it, the sensation of reading it. It says you, you feel it in a different way. I hope some of you managed to um, read along or by all means go back through it. Uh, I want to close uh, with uh, going back to London, as I promised John we would. And if Apple will behave, come on, we have one more. Beg your pardon, guys. Now, there's a little bit of tension here. Yes, last slide. We're back to London. This is Kate Tempest. 
a spoken word poet um, from London, we, in recent terms, have looked at some of Kate Tempest's work when reading Joyce. And I, I won't get into that because I just get too excited and we'll be here indefinitely. But the, the resonances between living in the 21st century in London and living in the early 20th century in London, in, Joy, in Dublin, in, in Joyce's work are incredible. And I'm hoping that this will, will draw together uh, some of what we've looked at in the last 20, 25 minutes. And that is, it's all I have really guys to share with you today and with the gang when we have them here in Dublin for their classes on their program is I just love reading, writing, talking about reading, talking about writing. It's, it's deep in my heart's core is the best way to describe it. And it's all I have to share is that with uh, the gang when they're with us. And it's this notion that Kay Tempest uh, refers to in her 2016 spoken word piece, Let Them Eat Chaos. We got to see Kate two years ago. And some of the gang hopefully tuned in today were at that. And we floated on, I certainly floated on air for weeks after that. And I've had messages from people subsequently to say, it just came back to me that we managed to see Kate Tempest in Dublin after having read her in class. It was, it was wonderful. We die so others can be born. We age so others can be young. The point of life is live, love if you can, then pass it on. And in the context of why we're here today, this notion of former IES students encouraging future IES students, supporting them, loaning them books, giving them the bus fare to get from Dublin to Donegal. That's sharing. That's something I think that, yeah, I, I'd be very proud to be part of that. And uh, hopefully that we will see uh, the sunshine again. And we look forward to welcoming whoever whoever feels like coming over and that come back all of you come back over but uh, i just want to close on on that notion that idea of live love and if you can uh, pass it on thanks for your patience guys and apologies to jody we definitely i owe you five minutes and we'll find some way to balance that out So now we get to hear from the students, is that right? The recorded? Do you want to introduce? Okay. I can, can certainly do that. Um, Alison, Ali, Zach, uh, and Priya. Um, I think that what I can say that will do justice um, to their efforts in this context is um, there's an extraordinary integrity at play with all three of uh, the gang. And it came across in their writing when they were here with us. Uh, it came across in conversation when they were here with us. And it comes across in what they have to share. I don't want to draw out anybody in, in particular, but what I can say is that thinking of them as individuals, I can do that. I can think of them as a collective as well. And this goes back to what Megan opened with. It broke our hearts to, to see you all leave in March and to leave so quickly. But I can say with 100% certainty, and I can say this without any disservice to uh, previous groups, and that is, the degree of investment that we saw on the part of the students in each other was extraordinary. They lived in each other's pockets. They carried each other through difficult times. I had obviously many conversations with each student in different contexts, but more often than not, a cluster would come in to the to 
the room in the center and be like, Stephen, we, ha we have a question. And there was that wonderful sense of momentum that um, together they were making things happen. They were interested in things. They were going places and they, they needed us occasionally. They needed us just to realize this little ambition, that little ambition. They needed a second opinion on that, a second opinion on that, spare pair of socks, whatever, directions for lunch, whatever. But they, from the very start, were invested in each other's company. They were in it together. And I think what they'll share with us now, um, I think will, will again, represent their integrity and their their sense of, the sense of togetherness that they felt uh, during the few short months that they had together. Not at first sound like a love letter, but I promise it is. Um, it's entitled "Love Letters Arrive Via Rain Post." Of Dublin, what do I recall? I draw a shawl around my cold shoulders and remember the wind at the intersection. I, stuck in the storm, wavering, the rain threatening to overrun the gun of the sun. As I ran back and back to the place that had become a home, to a warm shower where I would drop everything and jump in, wet mittens like soggy kittens that wouldn't dry for weeks after that day. The day I walked to the Hugh Lane in a storm, to sit with the middle-aged and old, I am told, that go to such Sunday musical events where I sat and wandered in mind, warming with a brisk walk through the idea land where I could go in and out with the music. And later downstairs I had a veggie Irish breakfast served on a wooden cutting board. Then I ran home in the pouring rain, ran and ran and ran, and maybe this was a moment of pain, but it begs the memory too of the other, other unexpected music, of the music sampler where the band with the screaming and the leaning in fans who loved with all their hearts, the kind of occasion the world or the kind of obsession the world so tries to drive out of our little souls. But these would be moments I would remember above the others. The sense of trying something new, the sense of black to blue, a softening into the moment, a reaching out to delve in, and the two music stand at different sides of the months. The gray face, a lace of noise, standing at the balcony where we didn't know there was just another band a few turns away. But I'm glad we didn't know, glad we didn't go. Because there's always more together when the weather turns strange and tints towards deranged. And I'm glad I wavered at the intersection, cold in my bones, because that's where the brain begins to stew and the stories brew and the memories discharge themselves in little marching lines. In moments of smell of taste, something so on the mind right now, and sight and fright and wonderings, in the smallest specificities do these memories of Dublin arise. And I don't know when memories begin to fable, start to rise with little bubbles of yeasted lies. But I do know that this is what I remember of a place. Not a face, or a feeling, or a street map, or a place detached, or a book's plot. But the moments isolated, that combine to form a patchwork place, because that's how they all are for me. All my homes I have so roamed. They're all a stitching of stories, Dublin no different. So the love is not the grandiose, because it never is, for me at least, you see. Maybe yours soar in the clouds over plains of Sagan, and I applaud you from the street corner, because the rain has stopped, and I think we should go, and I think we should both go for tea to warm us, and I will put the milk in first, and we'll paint our memories together, Dublin and I, watching the sky. Thank you. Now that my memory has grown monuments, museums littered with the debris of what they carried. I'm less worried about tinkering around in there with the implements of their making. I'd ignored the remnants of the city just as any terrible writer should until they grew aggressive at my avoidance and began testing their boundaries. Magpie feathers are everywhere up here, black and white and eerie as mimicry falling from rafters and gathering in corners as if about to form a new bird. They occasionally flutter from my head and summon the solitude of Marion Square. The wake of swans can be found up there as well, cutting the atmosphere of my subconscious as they cut the breath of the Liffey. The Liffey, of course, leaks out now and then, full of rusted bikes and the steely eye of a yellow sunrise. There's countless other artifacts too. The ample cup of coins I'd forgotten atop the refrigerator. 
the trees relaxing their shadows on the brick buildings across from St. Patrick's Cathedral, the man and the pigeon who sat together and read the newspaper, the frustration at having left the city for a weekend, being forced to come back. The list goes on and on. The box I put Dublin in is, I suspect, much like the world Noah hid from in his ark, shaking with vortexes and swells, and shaking with ghosts. When I excavate those memories, they come out of the bogs like a great Irish elf, as if still alive. I find something in their bones, like a sustained note of music, the kind compelling you to hold a thought in your mind until it becomes unutterably profound. And because this is Ireland, the music is a lament, the note, the sadness of Dublin, that completed me in a way no other has. It was tantalizing, without want of end, and it's what I remember most, picking through all this rubbish and archaeology. At night, the city would crinkle like a black canvas as it pulled away once a month, it seemed, to let us see the stars. On those Georgian streets, that sadness, rivaling happiness, took on the flesh and presence of a person. But it hides in here now, more ghosts than man, more ignorance than sorrow. It's evasive and indistinct. It catches me in daydreams and just stares. I like to call myself a poet, but I can't even hear its words, much less translate it to a written language. So I sit there, aggravated and writing nothing. Every vigil and ritual I perform fails to summon it back clearly because cups of Irish tea don't taste the same. Irish scones don't taste the same. Irish poems don't taste the same. So I let it all fester up there, the city in my head. James Joyce called Dublin a center of paralysis. To me, that last glimmer of rain hasn't yet hit the city and is suspended above like a flock of chandeliers waiting. Perhaps some would agree. Perhaps some would argue that quite a bit of water has flooded the streets since I last left. And rightfully so. For as much as my brain would have me believe, Dublin isn't some salvaged history of ruin viewed through the lens of a tear. The Royal and Grand Canals still flow the swans abreast with eyes to the Docklands. The whole city clenches its bones and waits for the next rainfall. So now that my memory has grown monuments, museums littered with the debris of what they carried, I can begin building up and tearing down the city that I knew. The melancholy, the solitude, everything stored up in those attics encode the same idea. Nothing new is found in memories, except for a point of view. And perhaps that's what they wanted me to find and bring to my attention this whole time. Thank you. In trains and bedrooms and sunlit cafes, she kept her eyes fixed on safe things, predictable things. Words scribbled in books, the blue and green plaid of her skirt, the foamy swirls on the skin of her cappuccino. But there was something about this window at this time of night that she couldn't resist. The lights of the city shone so bright they completely obscured her silhouette, and she stared into them cautiously, shyly, like they were a sea of sparkling eyes wanting to know her. This is one of my first writing exercises in Dublin, which Stephen, my short story professor, referred to as Drabbles. 100 word snapshots that would hopefully bloom into full stories. I always began the drapples with the intent to write fiction, but the first few lines would inevitably tug on threads from my own life, my own curiosities, questions, hungers, and fears. I didn't realize how autobiographical this drabble was until I returned to it later, almost a year after writing it. Since leaving Dublin, I've had a hard time knowing how to write about my study abroad experience without sounding trite. Like all the hundreds of young travelers before me, I can name all my favorite walks, bookstores, cafes, museums, classes, friends, and this would certainly be meaningful to me, but it would hardly be original. 
So instead, I returned to the sentence I wrote only a few days into my semester in Ireland. She didn't want to get snagged on her reflection. I arrived in Ireland with all the same hopes that I'm sure every other college student has when they leave home. That my travels would be like a giant eraser, effacing all the smudges, ink blots, and crossouts of my personality, and replacing them with clean lines, arrows full of direction and purpose. We mark every transition with this kind of ritual goal setting. New year, new place, new me. We love stories of travel and transformation. We all have dreams of achieving our own version of Elizabeth Gilbert's Eat, Pray, Love. Looking out my plane window, I wanted to see and enjoy Ireland without getting snagged on my reflection. All the anxieties, insecurities, and limitations I've carried with me through high school and college. I wanted to shake them off like the proverbial snake skin. I wanted to embody every travelogue cliche, the open chrysalis, the hatched egg, the fledgling wings buoyed by fortuitous winds. I wanted more than believed that such a metamorphosis would take place, and of course it didn't, but plenty of small serendipitous things happened instead. I saw a castle and made a friend. I walked through a beautiful city at night. I read novels, plays, and short stories that I never would have found back home. I watched films that plunged me deep into the rich and textured history of a country I'd never seen before. I met wonderful professors that made the world feel so much bigger than it had before. I met students from all over the U.S. whose creativity and vulnerability not only inspired my work, but motivated me to lean into the mysterious chaos of being a foreign student, to embrace the amorphousness, to get lost and challenge and surprised along the way. At the risk of sounding like yet another tourist swept off their feet by Dublin, I can trace a mental map of my walks through the city as though it were inked into my hands. I kept a running list of my favorite landmarks, bookshops, hikes, and hot chocolate. Phoenix Park, St. Stephen's Green, Grafton Street, the Queen of Tarts, Sandy Mount Strand. Of course, there were moments and even whole days when I felt snagged by my reflection. The girl I had hoped to leave in California. The girl who refused to be transformed. The girl who clung to her mildewy chrysalis until it glommed to her soft, flightless body. But as the weeks went by, I began to think of this girl not as a burden to heave off a plane, but as a companion, a little voice that would sit on my shoulder as I wrote a new story, that I could zip inside my purse if she was getting too loud. She wasn't spilled ink so much as creative material to draw from. She wasn't a curse so much as an incantation, sing-songy, repetitive, sometimes blowing sparks in my ears. Sometimes those sparks hurt, and other times they blew flickers of stories into flames. Through the fog of my own reflection, my stubborn little shadow that followed me through the streets of Dublin, the city still glittered.